Hi everyone, welcome back to this part two of my biology quick review for your ATI T's exam. So in the first video, we were going over biomolecules or macromolecules. We had gone over the first two, which were carbohydrates and lipids. So now we're going to move on to proteins and then nucleic acids. So as with the last macromolecules that we learned, carbohydrates and lipids, we went over what they are made out of, the structure of the macromolecule, and what kind of contributions they give to our body. So we're going to focus on these three things when it comes to these proteins, starting off with what they are made out of. First off, remember that monomers refers to the building blocks of macromolecules. Monomers are basically smaller molecules that make up bigger molecules. So the specific monomer of a protein are called amino acids. And these amino acids are referred to as polypeptides. Proteins have a different structure depending on how many proteins are present. The primary structure is a simple chain of amino acids, and this is called your amino acid sequence, also referred to as your polypeptide chain. There are 21 common amino acids that the body needs to function and to grow. Nine of these are called your essential amino acids. Now, these nine essential amino acids cannot be synthesized by the body, meaning they cannot be made by the body. In other words, you're going to need to get them through your diet, through foods. Let's go over a few types of proteins. The first one is structural protein. This is going to make things hard and rigid. A good example of a structural protein is keratin. Keratin is a type of protein that forms your hair and your nails. It's what makes these things hard and rigid. Next we have our enzymes. Enzymes catalyze chemical reactions. In other words, they accelerate the process of chemical reactions. Without these enzymes, some chemical reactions would never occur. The third type of protein are some hormones. So some hormones are made out of proteins or peptides and others are made out of steroids. And remember a side note, the steroid is a lipid. A few important hormones that are made out of proteins are insulin, glucagon, and pituitary hormones. Next we have a receptor. A receptor is a protein molecule that's usually found embedded within the plasma membrane surface of a cell. This receives chemical signals from outside of the cell, and when such signals bind to the receptor, they cause some sort of action or some sort of cellular or tissue or biological response. Next, we have antibodies. Antibodies are also known as immunoglobulins. They bind to antigens and they target them for destruction. So they work in our immune system to keep us safe from foreign bodies. Lastly, we have motor proteins. They convert chemical energy into mechanical work by the hydrolysis of ATP. Basically, they generate the forces that cause our muscles to contract. Alrighty guys, so this concludes what we need to know about proteins. So we are going to move on to our last macromolecule, which are the nucleic acids. Our nucleic acids include DNA and RNA. DNA stands for deoxyribonucleic acid and RNA stands for ribonucleic acid. Our nucleic acids are made out of the monomer called nucleotides. Remember, monomers are the building blocks of our macromolecules. Nucleotides consist of three portions. They have a phosphate, a sugar, and a nitrogenous base. Nucleotides make up both DNA and RNA. The nitrogenous bases in DNA are adenine, thymine, guanine, and cytosine. Adenine and thymine always pair together, and guanine and cytosine always pair together. Now let's take a look at the nitrogenous bases in RNA. We have adenine and uracil, guanine and cytosine. So adenine and uracil pair together, and guanine and cytosine pair together. So if we compare the nitrogenous bases in DNA and RNA, basically, Thymine is going to be replaced by uracil in RNA. So in RNA, we do not have thymine. We have uracil. 
So again, a nucleotide is made out of a phosphate, a sugar, and a nitrogenous base. So let's take a look at the structure of a DNA strand. DNA comes in a double strand and they run anti-parallel to each other, which just means that they're parallel, but one of the strands is basically going in the opposite direction of the other. Now we have our phosphates and our sugars that make up the ends of the DNA, and on the inside we have our nitrogenous bases. RNA comes in a single strand and it has the same nucleotides. The phosphates and sugars are on the outside and the nitrogenous bases are in the inside. Now the major difference is that in RNA we're replacing thymine with uracil. So there is no thymine, instead we have uracil. One other major difference between DNA and RNA is the sugar used to make DNA is deoxyribose, and the sugar used to make RNA is ribose, hence the name deoxyribonucleic acid and ribonucleic acid. So now we know the major differences between the structures of DNA and RNA, and we also know what these are made out of. We know that they're made out of nucleotides, which are the monomers or the building blocks of nucleic acids. So now let's focus in on their function, the function of DNA and RNA. In order to do that, we kind of had to take a step back, so let's talk about chromosomes first. Chromosome, by definition, is a thread-like structure of nucleic acids and proteins found in the nucleus of most living cells, carrying genetic information in the form of genes. Within each chromosome, you have hundreds to thousands of DNA. And if you take a snippet of each of these DNA sequences, you have genes. Genes and DNA are a little bit confusing. They seem like they could be the same thing. So here's a difference. Gene is a sequence of DNA or RNA that codes for a molecule. In other words, DNA, multiple DNA strands, or a sequence of DNA make up a gene. And multiple genes make up a chromosome. Now, DNA is a molecule composed of a double helix, and they carry around the genetic instructions used for growth, development, and functioning of all known living organisms. So again, each chromosome is made of hundreds of thousands of DNA, and a sequence of DNA makes up a gene, or a snippet of DNA makes up a gene, and your chromosomes are made of hundreds of genes within each one of them. So now we have a better understanding of the relationship between chromosomes, DNA, and genes. Now let's talk about RNA and see how RNA and DNA work together. The whole goal of DNA and RNA and why they work together is so that they can create proteins, or in other words, what we call protein synthesis. Remember that DNA is in the nucleus, and DNA does not leave the nucleus. That's why it needs assistance from RNA, specifically mRNA. M stands for messenger. So it acts as a messenger. It takes a little piece of DNA, or it takes its message, and it relays it all the way to the ribosomes. Once it's in the ribosome, rRNA and tRNA assist in making proteins. In other words, protein synthesis is inside of the ribosomes. So we're working with three RNAs here. The messenger RNA, mRNA, ribosomal RNA, rRNA, and the transfer RNA, tRNA. Protein synthesis happens in two major steps. The first is transcription and the second is translation. There are a few things you need to know about transcription and the first is that during transcription, DNA makes mRNA, tRNA, and rRNA with the help of a few enzymes. Secondly, during transcription, the DNA strands, the double helix, splits into two. One strand is called your template strand and your other is called your coding strand. Your template strand is what is used to create mRNA. One very relevant enzyme that's used during transcription is polymerase, polymerase enzyme. 
Polymerase is able to open up and split up DNA into two strands. It also stabilizes these two strands. Most importantly, it is able to synthesize or make mRNA. And it does this by reading and decoding the nucleotides on the template strand. Here I have a better picture of how RNA polymerase enzyme breaks through the DNA strands. It separates it into two separate strands, so it breaks that double helix, and it creates a new mRNA strand. So the mRNA here is that bottom strand on the bottom left-hand corner. That is your new mRNA strand that is created using the template strand of the DNA and using specifically the nucleotides to code it and to construct the mRNA. Let's take a detailed look at how the enzyme polymerase actually creates our mRNA. So let's pretend that this is part of the DNA. This is your template strand because in order to synthesize the mRNA, we only are going to use the template strand. If you need a reference, here is a picture of the full DNA. It's two strands, and remember, we're only using one. We're using that dark green template strand. Each of these light green bubbles are representing nucleotides or nitrogen bases to be specific. So remember about your nitrogen bases that they pair up, right? In DNA, you have adenine and thymine that pair up, guanine and cytosine that pair up. But in RNA, you're going to replace that thymine with uracil. So uracil and adenine pair up in RNA and guanine and cytosine pair up in RNA. Let's pretend here that we have C for cytosine. This is our particular nitrogen base that our polymerase enzyme is going to read. Now, it's going to say, okay, what correlates or what complements cytosine so that I can start making this mRNA? Guanine is the one that complements cytosine. So it's going to start by making one guanine. Then it's going to move forward to the next nitrogen base. Next, we have guanine. What pairs up with guanine? Cytosine. Next, we have thymine. What pairs up with thymine? Adenine, yes. So lastly, we have adenine. What RNA complements adenine? Remember that it's not thymine because only DNA has thymine. It's actually uracil. After your mRNA has a couple nitrogen bases, it forms a bond between them. This sums up the phase of transcription. After mRNA is made, it travels over to a ribosome, and this is where the phase of translation begins. Now, mRNA has this little package of information that it got from the DNA, and it's taking its little package of information and it's going to the ribosome. The ribosomes are basically like a manufacturing place. It's where things are made. So mRNA takes this information to the ribosomes, and with the help of tRNA and rRNA, they are going to create a protein here in the ribosomes. Let's look at our mRNA strand. In our strand, we have nucleotides, but these nucleotides come in a sequence of three. So every three or triplet is called a codon. So here we have a codon of guanine, cytosine, and adenine. There are 64 possibilities of different codons using the nucleotides adenine, uracil, guanine, and cytosine. 61 of them code for amino acids to make proteins. However, three of them are called stop codons, and these codons stop the translation process. So this is a very important part of translation. These codons are made out of nucleotides, right? And these codons are used to make amino acids. And remember that amino acids are the monomers or the building blocks of proteins. In other words, these amino acids make proteins. They are what they are made out of. So essentially what we're doing here in the ribosome is we are taking this codon 
and we are using these nucleotides and using them to code and generate the correct amino acids for the correct protein. So let's just use a common example of a codon. Let's just say we have AUG. These three nucleotides will be translated into an amino acid, and that amino acid is methionine. Methionine is an am amino acid or a building block of protein. It's a part of a protein. So when we have multiple codons together, and we have multiple amino acids, eventually they create an entire protein. Let's take a look at the transfer RNA and its role in this protein synthesis. So they are very important because they have something called anticodons. These anticodons are three nucleotides that complement the codons on mRNA. Let's just say, for example, here we have a mRNA strand and we have three codons here. Let's say one of the codons reads A, U, and G. tRNA is going to get the anticodons or the complements to A, U, and G, which so happen to be U, A, and C. So U is complement to A, A is complement to U, and C is complement to G. So the anticodon for AUG is UAC. So with the help of an enzyme, UAC is going to be read as the amino acid for methionine. So I know it feels like I'm moving in a circle here, but I feel like repetition really is going to help you understand this whole process because there are a lot of steps. So again, each of these codons are going to make amino acids and eventually multiple codons will make multiple amino acids or amino acid chain. And that is going to equal a protein eventually. So as far as the ATITs goes, this is probably as intricate as you're going to have to get when it comes to protein synthesis. In other words, the transcription and the translation part. So just make sure you know what exactly happens during transcription, like the general idea and the general idea of what happens during translation. Make sure you know which one comes first, transcription first, then translation, and which RNAs are involved in which. So in transcription, we know that mRNA is involved. And in translation, we know mRNA, tRNA and rRNA are all involved. And also one major takeaway is remember that protein synthesis actually happens inside of the ribosomes. Alrighty everyone, this concludes this video. Thank you so much for being here and for sticking around. I hope this video was of use for you and you learned something new. On my next quick review for biology for the ATITs exam, I'm going over cell division, structure of a cell, passive and active transfusion, osmosis filtration, and patterns of inheritance and genetics. So the next two videos of quick review bio is going to be very densely packed. I decided to cut this one short because I also feel like nucleic acids are pretty dense in itself. So go ahead and give your brain some rest and until next time guys.